Hi, my name is Sebastian Morgan Lynch. I'm the Health Policy Advisor for the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. Today I'm going to be giving you a rundown on the Health Information Privacy Code 1994 and the 12 Health Information Privacy Rules it has inside it, hopefully giving you some uh, easy answers to difficult questions and just a general rundown on the whole information privacy field, what it's all about. So first things first, what is privacy? The intuitive understanding of privacy is that it's uh, what an American judge called the freedom from intrusion upon seclusion. In other words, the, the freedom to be safe from prying eyes in your backyard, for instance. Another way of thinking about privacy is that it's about secrecy or confidentiality. But in fact, it's wider than that. It's wider than secrecy, wider than confidentiality, wider than security. Privacy is about control. It's about giving people some level of control over their personal information. And in many ways, it's a product of the computer age. Because back in the day, when all we had was, was paper and pens and files and folders to hold information about people, there were natural limits on the extent to which any one organisation could control data about a population. But now you can hold information about millions of people on a piece of technology smaller than a finger. Now, if knowledge is power then computer technology amounts to a huge rebalancing of power away from the individual and into the hands of large organisations and government agencies. Of course, in the health arena, this is slightly different. People trust their doctors and their right to. But it's up to you as people working in the health sector to ensure that you deserve that trust by having sound information handling practices. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So what is the Health Information Privacy Code? It's a modification of the Privacy Act of Now, a really important point to remember, and one that I'll be returning to through this presentation, is that the Health Information Privacy Code focuses on purpose and not consent. Although getting a person's consent or authorization for actions you might want to take in relation to their health information can be really important, it's not the key determinant. The key point to keep in mind is what purpose you collected a given piece of information for. The Health Information Privacy Code is driven by purpose. It has 12 information privacy rules which replace the 12 information privacy principles in the Privacy Act. In effect they're very similar. So Rule 1's pretty much identical to Principle 1, Rule 7 is pretty much identical to Principle 7. In order, Rule 1 says only collect the information you need. Rule 2 says get it from the person concerned. Rule 3 says tell them what you're doing. Rule 4 says be nice when you're doing it. Rule 5 says take care of the information once you've got it. Rule 6 says people have a right to see it if they want to. Rule 7 says they can correct it if they ask you. Rule 8 says make sure it's accurate before you use it. Rule 9 says get rid of it when you're done with it. Rule 10 says only use it for the purpose for which you obtained it. Rule 11 says only disclose it if that's why you obtained it. Rule 12 deals with unique identifiers and we'll talk about that at the end. So that's it in a nutshell. I'm going to spend the rest of this talk discussing the details that I skipped over, but there's some value in looking at the rules as I just did, as a whole, because they sketch out the information life cycle that you, as a person working in the health sector, need to think about. So rule one, what do you need? What's your purpose for collecting the information that you are collecting? Then you think, well, who are you going to get it from? Normally it's best to get it from the person if you possibly can. Rule three, when you do get it from the person, it's only fair to tell them what you're going to do with their information, and it's a legal requirement. Rule four, when you're collecting information, you've got to be nice, not underhand or deceptive when you're collecting information about people. Again, only fair. And once you've got the information, then a range of obligations attach to you as an employee of a health agency. You've got to take care of the information, and that's rule five. But also, if the people concerned or the person concerned comes asking about it, you've got to give them access to their own information. Similarly, if people come to you asking for you to correct the information you hold about them, you've got to either do it or attach a statement setting out how they disagree. Now, when it comes to actually using the information that you hold, another set of obligations attach. Uh, you've got to make sure it's accurate, up-to-date, complete, relevant and not misleading before you use it. You've got to get rid of it when you're done with it to make sure you don't have uh, old, irrelevant and potentially damaging information lying around. You've got to use it for the purpose for which you obtained it and you've got to only disclose it. Where disclosure was one of the purposes for which you collected it or where there's some other legal justification. And finally, Rule 12 deals with unique identifiers. So it's important because the National Health Index number is 
one of the biggest identifiers in New Zealand, but doesn't quite fit into my neat little scheme. So I'll talk about it at the end of this presentation. So now let's turn to who and what is covered by the Health Information Privacy Code. In a nutshell, if you're listening to this, then you very probably are covered by the code. The code regulates all health information about identifiable individuals held by health agencies in New Zealand. It applies to the public and the private sector, but doesn't override any law that regulates information. I'll just briefly expand on each of those points. First, what is health information? Now, obviously it's information relating to health services, but there's a point to keep in mind, which is that it's about identifiable individuals. So a file identified only by an NHI would be health information because it's about an identifiable individual. Discussion of anonymous health information never raises privacy issues. I won't say too much about the definition of health agencies under the code, except to note that if a complaint is made to the Privacy Commissioner and she looks into whether an interference with somebody's privacy has taken place, it's the agency she'll be contacting and the agency which is potentially liable. This is always the case unless the agency has done everything it could to stop a particular employee doing something, a breach of the, one of the rules of the code, uh, but nonetheless the, agent, the employee went ahead and did that action anyway. Now let's move to rules 1 and 2 of the total 12 found in the code. Now on to rule 1. Rule 1 says that agencies, health agencies, can only collect health information for a lawful purpose connected with a function or activity of the agency where collection of that information is necessary for that purpose. Now there's a couple of points to take away from that. One, know your purpose. I can't say that too many times. If an agency knows why it's collecting the information, then that tells it how it can use that information. So know why you're collecting the information. And the second point is only collect what's necessary. If you can't identify why you're collecting a particular piece of health information, you probably shouldn't be collecting it. So that's rule one. Now rule two. Rule two says get it from the person concerned wherever possible. It says that health agencies should go to the individual concerned when they're collecting health information about that individual. There's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, first, because mainly the best source of the information will be that individual, if, if it's about them. And second, if you go to them, they get a chance to say no. They get a chance to be told why you need the information. So in Rule 1 and 2, you can see the need to keep purpose and openness at the forefront of your mind when you're dealing with people's health information. And now to Rules 3 and 4. These rules regulate what you tell people when you collect their information and how you collect their information. Rule 3 says that when you collect information directly from a person, you need to tell them what you're doing and why and who's going to see it. Again, transparency. Rule 4 says when you're doing that collection, you've got to be professional about it. You can't collect information by means that are unfair, unreasonable or unreasonably intrusive. Rule 4 might come up in a health context when you're collecting health information from somebody about a sensitive matter and other people can hear them, for instance. And now to disclosure. Disclosing health information can become an issue because you have to disclose, you've been asked to disclose, or you want to disclose. In all of these cases, you can be faced with dilemmas. Now, the Health Information Privacy Code won't necessarily give you a rock-solid answer to every dilemma, but it'll give you a framework for answering difficult questions. So here's some examples of cases where you must disclose health information. Now, like I said earlier, Section 7 of the Privacy Act says that where there's a specific provision in some act requiring you to disclose, that takes precedence over both the Privacy Act and the Health Information Privacy Code. The Cancer Registry Act requires doctors to disclose a positive diagnosis of cancer to a central repository. Land Transport Act sections 18 and 19 require doctors and optometrists to uh, advise LTNZ when somebody is not safe to drive. The Mental Health Compulsory Assessment and Treatment Act requires that where somebody is going to be put into compulsory assessment or treatment that the whanau is given an opportunity to comment. And finally, the Health and Disability Commissioner Act and the Privacy Act both have provisions allowing those commissioners to investigate complaints against their respective statutes. If you're required to disclose under a statute, it's reasonably straightforward. The most you'd probably want to do is ask to see a copy of the relevant legislation that people claim to be relying on. It gets more complicated when you've been asked to disclose and it's up to you whether you do or not. 
There are some laws that require or allow disclosure, but only where a request has been made. For instance, the Official Information Act, which applies to public sector agencies, sections 22C and 22F of the Health Act, 1956, uh, which we'll go on to talk about, and a number of other provisions. Now, I'm afraid section 22F is where it gets a little bit complicated, at least in the way the law fits together, but I think it comes together in a fairly common sense kind of way. Section 22F allows certain people to make requests for health information. Once a request has been made, you as a health agency holding health information have to provide it unless certain circumstances apply. Now we're going to cover each of the, the variables there. Uh, you can see that the people who can make a request under Section 22F are the individual themselves, the individual's representative, and a person or agency who is providing or is going to provide health or disability services to that individual. Now in each case they're able to request access to information about the individual. Once you've received a Section 22F request, it has to be treated in much the same way as a request by the person themselves. Going back a bit to the people who can make a Section 22F request, one of those groups of people is representatives of the individual. Now that's defined as where a person's dead, their personal representative, which is the executor or administrator of, a, of the individual's estate. Uh, if the person's under 16, whether they're dead or alive, then their parent or guardian, and where a person cannot give consent or exercise their rights, somebody acting lawfully on their behalf or in their best interests. Sorting out whether somebody is the representative of an individual is normally reasonably straightforward. If the individual is deceased, then it's fairly easy to tell whether somebody is their executor or administrator, and similarly where the individual is under 16. Do note though that the custodial parent or guardian has no additional rights over the non-custodial parent or guardian. As you'll see, uh, there is some leeway to decline to provide information when a non-custodial parent is requesting information, but that doesn't affect their representative status. Basically, parents or guardians have a limited right of access to information about their children. Finally, where a person can't give consent or exercise their rights, for instance if they're unconscious, then somebody who came in with them, or who is acting on their behalf, or who has a, a formal authority, for instance under the Protection of Personal and Property Rights Act, can be considered as that individual's representative. Next up is a chart showing how Section 22F actually works. As you'll see, upon request, the holder of health information has to disclose it to the person making the request, uh, unless given set of principles apply. If it's the individual, then it's just the same as a, a personal access request. If it's the representative, then the people holding the information may refuse if to disclose the information would be contrary to the individual's interests, or the person has vetoed the disclosure of their information. Now if either of these is the case, then as the holder of the health information, you can refuse the request. And in a similar vein, if an agency that's providing or going to provide health services, like a, a new GP, requests information and the individual doesn't want disclosure, then the agency holding the information can refuse that request. So that covers off where you have to disclose or where you've been asked to disclose. But what about when you want to disclose? First question is to ask yourself whether the information is about an identifiable individual because if, you, if you're dealing with aggregate or anonymized information then you can pretty much do what you want with it. Where this isn't the case and you want to disclose you need to find a law that allows you to disclose and there, there are a range of them. For instance the Children, Young Persons and Their Families Act 1989 uh, allows any person to disclose any kind of information about a child's well-being to a police officer or a social worker. That part of the SIFTS Act can act as a kind of whistleblowing provision. Uh, another whistleblowing provision is found in the Protected Disclosures Act 2000. That act, that's been called the Whistleblowers Act in fact, allows disclosure of what's called serious wrongdoing to an appropriate agency. Rule 11 of the code is probably the most complicated part of it, but in essence it's very simple. It says that you shouldn't disclose health information about a person unless one or more of the exceptions applies. And like I just said, even if one of those exceptions do apply, you're not required to disclose. So obviously that means the exceptions are fairly important, and these are some of them. Not the whole list, but uh, 
representative selection. I really recommend reading Rule 11. If you read one part of the code, do get a copy of Rule 11 from your privacy officer and have a read. So Rule 11.1, the first part, says that disclosure is allowable if it's to the individual or their representative, we've already discussed who a representative is, or is authorised by them, if the disclosure is for one of the purposes for which the information was originally collected, and that brings back the purpose element we mentioned right at the beginning of the presentation, or if the information was from a publicly available source. In other words, if you got the information from a publicly available source like a newspaper or from the web, then you can pretty much do what you want with it, same as if it's uh, uh, aggregated or anonymised. And finally, if somebody seeking information about somebody in hospital, then anybody can disclose general information about their presence, location and condition on the day the request was made, unless the, specific, the patient specifically vetoed that request. Rule 11.1 deals with anticipated disclosures. Rule 11.2 deals with disclosures that might not be anticipated. And as you'll recall, if you can anticipate a disclosure, you need to have advised the person about it, if, if at all possible. That's because of Rule 3. So Rule 11.2 has a range of scenarios. If, as an agency, you believe on reasonable grounds that disclosure is for a directly related purpose or for statistical or research purposes, then you can disclose information. If it's necessary to prevent or lessen a serious threat to public health or safety or the life and health of the individual or somebody else, or if it's necessary to avoid prejudice to the maintenance of the law or the conduct of proceedings in a court or tribunal. And so on to storage and security, which is Rule 5. Now this rule is reasonably straightforward. It just says that a health agency that holds health information must take reasonable security safeguards to protect that information against loss, unauthorised access, use, modification or disclosure, or other misuse. Now that of course raises the question, what is reasonable? And it's a little bit weasel wordy, but I have to say it depends. If it came to the Commissioner as a complaint, then what you'd be looking at was whether the steps that were taken to protect the information were reasonable. Relevant considerations are the sensitivity of the information, the potential for harm if the information goes astray, and how easily it could have been protected. Security is a large topic, and you'll find some useful guidance on it in the Health Information Privacy Code commentary, which you should be able to get from your privacy officer. But just uh, a couple of issues you might want to consider are physical security and operational security. Now physical security is things like having lockable filing cabinets so that you can lock away personal information at the end of the day, uh, having keycard access to sensitive areas, and even simple things like turning whiteboards containing clinical data away from public areas. Operational security uh, includes things like the contracts signed by employees, confidentiality agreements with cleaners, uh, regularly changing passwords on computers, and encrypting or password protecting information stored on external devices like laptops or flash drives or CD-ROMs. Rules 6 and 7 deal with access and correction of health information. Now these are the two rights that you get in New Zealand under the Health Information Privacy Code. Rule 6 says that if health information is readily retrievable, then the people concerned, the people who the information is about, have a right to confirmation from the agents about whether the information is held about them, and to have access to that information. This right applies to information regardless of where that information was obtained from. When you receive a request under Rule 6, or a request from somebody for their personal information, there's a range of procedural things you need to take very good care to comply with. First, the request can be in any form, written or oral. Second, the right to access information doesn't amount to a right to own that information. So even though a person can see their medical file, they can have a copy of their medical file, they can't take it away with them. They, they can't take it from you. The right doesn't extend that far. Third, people can appoint agents to make requests on their behalf. Uh, but you need to make sure that the agent is properly authorised, that he or she has got some written authority, and that the person has been satisfactorily identified. 
There's a range of other obligations on an agency that's received a Rule 6 request. They have to provide assistance to the requester. Uh, if they don't have the information sought, then they have to transfer it to somebody who does. They have to tr inform the individual of what decision has been made on the request. And they need to respond within the time limits, the statutory time limits, which is 20 working days. And finally, the agency receiving a request needs to make the information available in the form requested unless there's some really good reason why not. So in a nutshell, if somebody asks for a copy of their file, then they're legally entitled to it. Just to reiterate a point I made earlier, when you receive an access request, it's vitally important that you respond within the time limits. Now that doesn't mean that the person has to receive what they're seeking within the, the 20 working day time limit, but they do have to receive a response. And if it's going to take longer than 20 working days to get in the information, they need to be told why. Now, of course, there are cost implications to providing people with their own information, with access to their own information. Uh, unfortunately, for public sector agencies, there's not the ability to charge for providing that access. Private sector agencies can only charge if the same information has already been requested within the last 12 months or for providing expensive materials like copies of X-ray films. In fact, of course, often uh, images like that can be provided in inexpensive electronic form, in which case they wouldn't be charging for that either. The right of access is very strong, but there are some reasonably restrictive and common sense grounds whereby an agency can withhold information from an individual, even if they've made a request for their own personal information. Without going into the entire list, some uh, withholding grounds that might be relevant uh, include the possibility that releasing the information would prejudice the maintenance of the law, which often comes up in, in fraud investigations or sometimes criminal investigations. Uh, releasing the information would endanger somebody's safety, that it would be an unwanted disclosure of somebody else's affairs, that it would prejudice the physical or mental health of the requester, or the information is not readily retrievable or can't be found or doesn't even exist. Of those, the one that probably needs the most explanation is the third one, the unwarranted disclosure. Where that's likely to come up is where there's mixed information. For instance, if you've done an interview with a family member of the individual making the request, and they've talked about the individual, but asked you to keep that information confidential. Now, one thing I can be clear about is that you can't ever promise confidentiality, because in the end, it might not be up to you. It might be the Privacy Commissioner or the Human Rights Review Tribunal making the final decision. What you can say is that you'll do your best to keep the information confidential, and that will be relevant if the Privacy Commissioner comes to consider a complaint of that kind. Rulesen deals with the right to correction. It says that individuals have a right to request correction or request that a statement of correction be added to their file when they disagree with it. On receiving a request like that, the agency has to either make the change requested or attach a statement of the correction sought but not made. In other words, if the agency doesn't want to make a change, they need to ask the person making the request for a, a written statement of how they disagree with the information held about them. That statement needs to be attached to the file and a copy sent to anybody who, to the knowledge of the agency, might have the uh, incorrect information or allegedly incorrect information. The same procedural provisions apply to requests under Rule 7 as do to requests under Rule 6, so you've got 20 working days to respond to a correction request. Finally, on to Rule 12. Rule 12 regulates unique identifiers like the National Health Index or NHI number. Now there's a couple of questions that arise. First, why does it do this? And second, how does it do it? The reason why we regulate unique identifiers is mainly down to function creep. When you've got a single unique identifier that ties together a vast range of related information, it's very tempting to take that information, tied together by the unique identifier, and apply it to other, for other purposes. An example is the social security number in America. That started out as a basic identifier for social services, and now it's sort of a de facto national unique identifier. Now that's not a terrible thing, but it does mean that you get a lot of unintended consequences around the use of a number that's signed for one purpose for a whole range of other purposes. It also makes it much easier to carry out fraud and identity theft. So that's the why, what's the how? 
We regulate unique identifiers by saying the only agency that can assign a unique identifier is the one that's already assigned it. What that actually means is that a unique identifier is restricted to a particular agency. So the IRD number, the only agency that can use that IRD number to uniquely identify taxpayers is the IRD. With the National Health Index it's a little different in that any agency essentially in the health sector can assign the National Health Index number. And in this context assign just means using the number to uniquely identify somebody. On a practical level as a person working in the health sector all you need to make sure is that you've clearly identified somebody before you assign an NHI number to them and that you're not allowing the number to be used outside the health sector. Now a few times through this presentation I've mentioned the Commissioner investigating complaints and that is one of her roles, looking into complaints of breaches of the Health Information Privacy Code. The way that works is first she determines whether there's been a breach of one of the rules, for instance if information was disclosed where there's not a justifiable exception or where somebody took more than 20 working days to respond to an access or correction request. And then once she has determined that there is some kind of breach, then she decides whether there were any adverse consequences as a result of that. And what that means is whether there was loss, detriment, damage or injury, whether the, the breach adversely affected the rights, benefits, privileges, obligations or interests of the individual, or resulted in significant humiliation, loss of dignity or injury to feelings. In other words, did the individual suffer harm as a result of the action complained about? I'm receiving a complaint, and she gets about a thousand a year, the Commissioner will first look at whether she has jurisdiction. Sometimes it might be the Health and Disability Commission that should be dealing with it, or maybe the Ombudsman if it's an Official Information Act matter. If she doesn't, take, she'll take no further action. If she does, she'll try and sort out the matter as quickly and as simply as possible with the Assessment and Conciliation Team. If that doesn't work, it moves on to the Investigations Team, and it may result in the Commissioner having to make a finding of whether or not there's been interference with somebody's privacy. A fairly small number of those thousand complaints actually end up in a finding. Most of the time they can be resolved in another way. So that brings us to the end of this presentation. I hope you feel a little more educated about health information privacy. Uh, if not, there is an inquiries hotline uh, on 0800 803 909. Feel free to call with any queries. Thanks. Have a great day.